So today I am joined by none other than the former European light heavyweight champion, Eric Skoglin. How are you? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Today is a good day. Uh, yeah. Good. What's the uh, what's the weather like in Sweden? Uh, today it's uh, kind of cold but sunny uh, and uh, yeah, uh, a, a cool uh, eastern day. Uh, but uh, yeah, normally it's like dark and cold and wet, so it's pretty good. Good, good. Well, it sounds uh, sounds very similar to uh, to British weather, you know. So um, we're going to go straight into your boxing now. How did you get into boxing and at what age? Uh, I was 11. Uh, I was doing some karate. I started with that when I think I just turned 10. And my brother was uh, into boxing and uh, because he was far more violent than, than I was and bigger as well. And uh, he uh, started to, to push my father and uh, wanted to start a boxing class. Uh, and when he turned 12, uh, he was allowed to, uh, so he started boxing and I had like, uh, the karate club didn't have training sessions during the summer, so we had a break and in the summer break I joined my brother in the boxing club and uh, yeah, I got stuck there. Super, what, what style of karate was it? Uh, Jushin Kai, I think, I think it was Jushin Kai, I, I'm not familiar with the styles anymore, no. I, I forgot most of it. Uh, uh, I know in Sweden, um, Kyok Shinkai is, uh, is very big in the full contact uh, style. There's a lot of very good fighters. From, uh, yeah, I believe it is. But th this was no full contact because uh, we were too young. So we were just like standing and practicing in the, with the shadow boxing style. So yeah, it was uh, suited me very well because I was weak and had a nose that uh, like pissed blood uh, as soon as you touched it. So <laughs> I was no, I was no talent in boxing at all. And um, when when I started boxing, I, I remember both my my father and my brother. Uh, they, they said like, uh, well, he can try this as well if he wants, but uh, if he wants, hang around for for long. As soon as they start to punch him, he will quit. So that was pretty much what everyone believed. Right, yeah, well, they believe wrong because um, you had 114 amateur fights, if my memory serves me correct. And, yeah, uh, I did. And I had about 60, like, in Sweden, you don't get to start amateur boxing until you're 15. Uh, and before that, we have something called, like, uh, it's called diploma boxing, but it's uh, schoolboy boxing, kind of. You, you, you don't get points for hitting your opponent you, you get points for you you know your style how good is your defense how good is your footwork and and your clean punches and stuff like that so that that's the way you start in sweden and i did that and i had about 60 fights and then i turned amateur and yeah i was competing a lot yeah you you you, you did very well as an amateur take us through uh the different things you won yeah, I, I, I won in Sweden. I won pretty much everything you can win. Uh, I won the Nordic Championship as well. Uh, in the European Championship and, and World Championships, I, I competed, but I lost the, in the first uh, round uh, every time. Uh, so I wasn't lucky at those kind of tournaments. And uh, yeah, but I, I had issues with the national team as well. So it was not just unlucky uh, competing in those tournaments. It was like um, I didn't get the preparation that I wanted. I, I know you won the, um, the Swedish Youth, Youth National Championship in 2006, uh, yeah. and then the Junior Championship in 2007. And then you took uh, second place at senior level the same year in 2007, at um, the age of 15. Um, yeah. In 2008, you finished second place um, in the Senior Championships uh, coming second to your fellow countryman, uh, Badu Jack. Yeah, no, I fought him three times, I believe, as an amateur. So I have one, one uh, split decision loss uh, to him, but I lost all, all three bouts against him. Uh, he's, he, he's a great fighter. These days he's, he's great, but he was good amateur as well. And, Are uh, you both friends? 
now we're not close. I haven't spoken to him in years. So, but uh, I see he's doing really good, uh, really good. Well, you, um, you, you, the year after 2009, you, uh, you won the national and uh, Nordic championships at senior level. And, yeah. um, and then in 2010, May 2010, at the age of 18, you decided to turn professional. Now, just to say, a lot of people probably don't realise there's, there's a lot of history with Sweden and professional boxing that was banned for, uh, for several years. And um, yeah, was. The, the, the stance on it. So uh, I guess with that in mind, what inspired you to want to turn professional? I think I, I always had in, in, in mind, in, in the back of my head, that I wanted to turn professional at some point. But uh, my main goal was to compete in the Olympics 2012. Uh, and I wanted to do that at first. Uh, but I had some issues with the national team. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to do this in terms of the national team, I, I won't make it to the Olympics. I, I will fail uh, because I couldn't perform as I wanted to uh when i had the training camps and the preparations with with the national teams so uh i decided to to split up with the national team and actually i, I got uh, contacted by the danish national team uh, because they had uh, uh like uh they wanted to to uh, develop their their team uh by competing in the bundesliga uh, in Germany, so it was a Bundesliga, but there, there was a Danish national team there called the Box Team Null, and uh, yeah, they had a, a free spot in 81 kilo, uh, so they contacted me and asked if I wanted to compete for them in 81 kilo, and I said, well, yes, I want to. Uh, so I did two sessions, uh, two, two uh, seasons for Box Team Null in the Bundesliga and that was the way the team Sauerland got their eyes on me as well so after a while uh, they came with an offer uh, and yeah I remember we traveled to Berlin to their head office me and my father and uh, yeah we were gonna uh, discuss the, the terms and see what what they came up with and, and as I saw, saw that I wanted to, to stay in Sweden. I just wanted to compete uh, for them. Um, but I had, no, I had no idea what they were going to offer me. And when they came up with their offer and then they said, but of course you have to move to Berlin uh, if you want to, to fight for Team Sauron. Uh, then I thought, well, <laughs> I better move to Berlin because this is a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity. So with that said, we, we, I got an apartment in, in uh, Berlin, uh, but I wanted to spend most time at home anyway. So I got a deal with my uh, boxing coach, Kasten Rever, uh, and we agreed on that I'm, I'm showing up like six weeks for a fight uh, and then I can do my uh, strength and conditioning training at home. So that was... Uh, that was about it. Yeah, well, you, um, like I said, turning over 18, that was a very gutsy move. Um, you know, you're still maturing um, physically. Um, yeah, I remember my first fight <laughs> was like, uh, I was weighing like 85 when I uh, signed the contract. And I, and I thought to myself, I, I will grow. And everyone said I, I would grow. So uh, we, we say you're fighting cruiserweight. Uh, which is 90, a little bit more than 90. Uh, and uh, after the training camp, the first training camp, I lost weight. So <laughs> the first fight, I weighed in at 82. Uh, and my opponent was 90. Uh, and it was like, he was, he, he was fairly good for a dangerous opponent for a first fight, uh, you know, making your debut. He had two and no, uh, two K victories. So in heavyweight, he was moving down from heavyweight. So yeah, he was, he could hit. Uh, <laughs> luckily, l luckily, he didn't hit me. He couldn't catch me. So I was uh, able to stay away from him. Incredible. Um, in 2012, uh, you fought Pablo Sosa on the undercard of uh, Mikhail Kessler against Alan Green at the uh, Parkland yeah, Stadium. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I and, uh, the fight. 
Yeah, two reasons for that. It was it was a good fight. It was a massive stage. It was fifty thousand people in the uh, Park and Stadium. It was absolutely yeah, it was. Um, and I, I was ringside for that. I remember. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, it was great the atmosphere. But I I, I didn't realise um, that people are allowed to smoke in there. So uh, as as people started to come in more and more, I mean, uh, whether you like smoking or not, you were getting a a, a decent lung full of uh, of, of cigarettes in there. What, what was yeah. your memories of that night? Yeah. Uh... I remember both my fight, uh, uh, and that was a hard test for me. He was he was uh, he was a tough lad. This Pablo Sosa uh, coming forward all the times, uh, and I mean, taking the shots in his forehead. Uh, he was like more or less catching the shots with his forehead. So uh, I remember my my fists were really uh, <laughs> hurting after that fight. But uh, yeah, it was a good fight. He took me uh, for eight rounds, and uh, yeah. I remember, I, I think I developed a lot after the fight. Yeah, I, I remember um, a lot of people at ringside sort of saying, you know, watch this guy here. He's young, he hits hard, but he's got good movement with it. So uh, it was certainly some great showcasing. And um, six fights later, 13th of April, 2013, you won your first title, the WBC Youth World Light Heavyweight title against uh, Luke Blackledge. Remember that one? Yeah, yeah I remember that one as well. Uh, I remember that one. Uh, that was not a good fight for me. Uh, that was maybe not the worst, but it, it was one of the worst fights that I, I have done because I was I was very nervous. Uh, uh, and I remember I hit him with a clean shot in the first round and he took a knee. He didn't get a count, but he took a knee. And I thought to myself, I, I want to, to knock him out. You know, I want to, he should have been getting a count. Uh, so I was throwing punches and uh, wasting all my energy in that first round, uh, trying to, to stop him. Uh, I didn't succeed and I was so tired. After like five, six rounds in that fight, I was totally exhausted. I, I, I thought to myself, I, I can't do this. And he was like, he was not hitting hard, but he was hitting a lot. Uh, from different angles and boxing quite all unorthodox so he was like almost breaking me down um, but then I had to stay away and give a few rounds away uh, before I could come back and finish it with not in style but better style and uh, uh, yeah I got the decision so I was I was happy with the decision and the victory and uh, my first title and I learned a lot from that fight. No, absolutely, yeah. You, you, you certainly, it showed very quickly how much you'd learned um, because two fights later, in your 18th contest, you beat uh, Lolenga Mock for yeah. the light heavyweight European title. Um, Mock was, uh, was a tough guy. Um, take us through that fight. Yeah, he was a tough guy. And I, I remember I was like, I was staring at... Uh, uh, for the scorecards I was wondering a lot so I came back after the first round uh, which was stiff for my part uh, and I asked my coach how did it went did I get around and he said to me yes you, you got around but stop focusing on that uh, focus on your on your boxing you're, you're stiff you're, you're uh, not doing as good as you should uh, but yes you got around and I was like uh, uh, still focusing on, on the result and the second round started and uh, and I went in, still stiff, came back to the corner after that round and asked him again, uh, did I get around? And he said, yes, you get the round, stop focusing on that. And then the third round began. And about a minute into that, I was like running into his haymaker shot, uh, his uh, right hand, uh, and he was throwing it. And I was moving forward, running to it, and I was just like, fell against the ropes and the uh, referee started to count and i was like "Fuck, this is I, I mean i couldn't feel my legs they were just wobbling and I, I i just tried to stay up straight and look like i was ready to go and i thought to myself every moment i hope he thinks i'm ready to go i hope he thinks i'm ready to go and <laughs> when he said eight and then box i was thought to myself "Fuck." He thinks I'm ready to go. <laughs> and I was just like trying to stay away from his punches because he was running at me, throwing punches from every angle. And I was like 
just trying to cover up and throw back some punches, just alibi punches to to make them not stop the fight. And then I get back to my corner after the third round and I said to to my trainer, well, now it's a tie because I won the first two, uh, 10-9, and then I lost this one, 10-8-10. And the fourth round in that in that fight is still one of the best rounds in my career. It was uh, like everything just, yeah, uh, every nerves and every, all that just disappeared. And I was like fighting for my life in that round. Beautiful. Well, you, you won the uh, European strap and not, not any sort of Mickey Mouse one. It was the proper European title, not the WBO Intercontinental European strap or whatever it is. It was the, the proper one. It was, it was uh, well done for your, for your age as well. Um, I heard a rumor that you should have originally been fighting Enzo Macronelli for the title. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't remember really the negotiations uh, because I wasn't uh, taking care of them myself. I was just like getting to know what was happening and what was going on behind the stage. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I remember it was talking about uh, Enzo Macronelli. That could have been a good fight. That could have been a good fight. I'd, I'd love to, to, to share the ring with Enzo. He's a, he's a legend in my eyes and I, I watched him a lot. Uh, in my younger days, I watched him really good. I remember his left hook. Uh, yeah, I started his left hook to the body a lot. And that's, uh, that's in my opinion, it's his most dangerous shot. So Nice. Well, we'll make sure we copy him into this uh, when it's um, spread all over social media. He'll, he'll give you some love, as I say, you know. <laughs> Um, now, in your eight fights, um, in the next eight fights, you beat Glenn Johnson, a very, yeah. very tough man. Um, but then in your 20s... Yeah, he was. I mean, I, I, he was, you know, many people said he was over the hill. And of course, he was over the hill. Uh, but he wasn't that far over the hill that, uh, uh, that most people thought. And he was there to win that night. He was, I remember, he was really disappointed uh, after the decision. And he was, uh, yeah, he was aiming for a win, for a real comeback. And I remember that fight for another reason as well, because I was in such pain in that fight. I fought that with the herniated disc in my back. Uh, it happened in training, the last sparring session before. Uh, and I was like getting home after that training session and I got the fever and I was like, well, I'm not feeling good. And I had such a pain in my back. And uh, I went to the doctor the next day and they adjusted the, the back a little bit. And I asked him, the fever was gone. So but I asked him, could I fight with this? And he said, well, if you can, it's possible, but I wouldn't do it. Uh, and so we went up to the, this fight was in Denmark. So we went up from Germany where we had our camp. And I was still not sure if I was going to do the fight or not. Uh, but I weighed in uh, and went to the arena the next day. And I was still like, am I really going to do this? Yeah, I I'm going to do this. <laughs> I decided in the dressing room, I I'm really going through with this. I so I'm, I warmed up for like a few hours, just starting carefully moving around. And I remember after the, the ring walk, when I bent over and went under the ring, under the ropes, it, it hurt so bad in my back. And I thought to myself, fuck, what am I doing? What am I doing? Why am I doing this thing? Uh, but it, it, it did. And yeah, luckily, uh, I had an angel on my shoulder and I competed at that fight and, and won. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great performance. And uh, Glenkoff Johnson is one of those guys that um, he could be 100 years old and he's still going to give problems. He just yeah, I believe so. I, be I believe so. He, he's uh, I see him uh, still hitting the bag and he's yeah, he's he looks good. He looks the yeah. same as he did. No, yeah, he's, he's, he's ageless. He's like he's yeah. like uh, Luis Ortiz, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, your, your 27th fight, you uh, you dropped down to super middleweight for the. Uh, uh, the World Boxing Super Series. How tough was it to make 168 pounds? It was tough. It was, it, no excuse. It was really tough. But but I was on a diet already, uh, and I was I was on a diet in 10 months for that fight. Uh, so I started my diet even before I knew the fight was gonna happen, uh, because 
we were negotiating with with uh, a lot of guys and it was talking about Nathan cleverly in the light heavyweight fight uh, for the WBO title and it was a lot of other options as well uh, that we didn't land and I was like getting frustrated and I, I spoke to, to my uh, promoter the Saulans and I asked him what why why is it so hard to, to land a fight and they said the same thing that they had said for many times before like something big is coming something big is coming and I was like well you you better bring me something big now because I'm getting tired of waiting. And then they brought me the World Boxing Super Series. And I was like, well, uh, this would be awesome. If I could compete in the World Boxing Super Series, it would be awesome. And then they presented the weight classes and it was super middleweight and cruiserweight. The one below my weight class and the one above. And I was like, well, if I can get a place, I would... I would either either go up or down, you know. It's it's uh, wherever I can fit in, uh, and uh, yeah, of course, uh, moving up was no option. So I got down, got to go down to to super middleweight, and uh, well, I was it, it was it was hard for me, but it was not not impossible. Well, you um you fought Callum Smith, who you know became the eventual winner of the whole competition. Um. And uh, yeah. you were very competitive in that fight as well. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was my first loss. And I remember I, th I remember a lot of guys actually said that I should have won that fight. And it was a close one. Uh, unluckily for me, the fight was at his backyard. And you, you don't win such a close fight at, at someone's backyard. It's impossible. So... Uh, well, I got my first loss, but I thought to myself, I'm going to beat this guy in a rematch. So I focused on getting the WBC silver belt uh, and to stand as the mandatory challenger for Callum Smith while he won the tournament, as I knew he was going to. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I booked the fight against Rocky Fielding for, uh, for the WBC silver belt. Uh, unluckily for me, that fight never happened because uh, the fight of my life came came in in front of it, and that was the the rehab fight, uh, the fight for my life. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I'm just, still just, competing. just to say, so the Rocky Fielding um, fight um, should have happened uh, in in November, and um, on the undercard of Hay Bellew, but then uh, David Hay suffered an injury, so that that whole. Uh, tournament, uh, whole competition, whole evening of boxing, shall I say, was off. Yeah, it, sh it should have been in December, actually. Uh, yeah. It should have been in December, but it wasn't. Uh, it was uh, moved uh, to the next year and I was still in a training camp and I thought to myself, well, I, I continue sparring, I, I, I'm getting better and I, I think I'm, I'm in good shape uh, and getting, getting stronger and stronger in the sparring sessions. So I, I stayed in the, in the fight mode uh, Keep, kept sparring and uh, well with, with with this said I, I had a new adopted kind of a new style uh, before that fight because having my first loss against uh, Colm Smith uh, uh, aboard fighting aboard I thought well I'm gonna need to to be more aggressive and I need to to cut off the ring and move forward a bit uh, maybe take one punch to, to be able to land two so that was the way I sparred as well. And that could work in a fight. You know, you, you, you could take one punch to, to land two uh, and, and take that kind of chance in, in a fight. But to do that in sparring, session after session with sparring partner after sparring partner, we brought sparring partners from the whole world. They stayed for one or two weeks and they left to come another one. And at the same time, I... I uh, brought up my, my sparring sessions from uh, two sessions a week to three sessions a week. And uh, so it was a really, it was too much sparring uh, before that fight. Uh, and I think I didn't get to rest enough either uh, after my first loss against Callum Smith. So yeah, I started the training camp too fast and uh, yeah, went too hard. So in, in December 2017, um, you, you suffered a brain hemorrhage in one of those sparring sessions. Uh, do you have any memory of that on the day at all? 
um no nah, like... nah, just created members you know people have told me and my family have told me and yeah uh i've uh i've fought a lot of inner battles you know to with with that uh happening yeah well i um i i i wrote paul ingall's book um about let me see seven eight years ago and uh obviously he ended up with a much more severe uh, brain injury than yourself um but that a short-term memory of, of surrounding the actual incident usually sort of completely wipes away from the person's uh, memory in there. But yeah. what was your memory of the rehabilitation after um, the hemorrhage? Well, I remember people around me saying like it was uh, uh, going very fast and I was doing very well. Uh, but I thought uh, myself that... Uh, I wasn't and I thought that things were going way too slow and you should have seen me when I was fit because I, I didn't I didn't understand really what, what actually had happened and where I was and uh, how bad it was. So I just wanted to leave the hospital, go back to training, uh, get another fight and, you know, straight things out. Uh, so that was uh, that was my ambition the whole time. Uh, so, uh, and, and I remember my, my family told me that uh, the doctors had said, uh, but, uh, because they were very worried about me uh, when I was still in a coma. And uh, they said like, but, but uh, things can be good as well. And we have another young uh, person who had this kind of accident and uh, he was able to leave the hospital after four months. So things can go well uh, too and uh, I didn't know that story when I was walking out with a stick this person had left in a wheelchair after four months uh, with similar uh, similar injury and I left with a stick after two weeks uh, and I thought well I'm just gonna go back to the gym <laughs> get back in shape the, I, I didn't understand why people were looking so strangely at me uh, because once again, I didn't understand what had happened. Yeah, you, your fitness certainly would have been a big factor for you getting out that quickly and not being in a wheelchair. Um, yeah, but, of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember seeing the photos of you uh, from from the hospital soon after um, the sparring session, and uh, it, it choked me up. It really did. It was it was horrible to see. Um, but then to see footage afterwards, I remember sort of seeing footage of you. Um, slowly, you know, sort of re rehabilitation, and then in June 2019, you know, I was uh, I was over the moon when I got to chat with you at the York Hall, um, which was, you know, three months shy of, of, of two years, or actually it was a year and a half after you'd had the uh, the hemorrhage, and um, and you were in the corner of your teammate Anthony Yidget. So uh, was was that your first big boxing outing after the accident, or had you been already sort of? involved with, uh, with other fighters or back to the gym no I, i've been back to the gym i was i remember i was back to the gym the same the same week as i was pretty much coming home from the hospital or not, not the same week but very soon after that uh because i i did my whole rehabilitation uh rehab training at at the same gym because it's a it's a massive gym and they, they have supported me since since I started, so I, w I could do every kind of training there. Uh, so so I've I've been down there uh, for a long time already, uh, and I've been training boxing as well. And boxing have been uh, the biggest part of my rehabilitation training uh, because it's uh, you know it's a really good uh, exercising for the whole body and uh, for your. Uh, eye hand uh, connection and your reflexes and things like that so it's uh, really the best the best tra possible training for me how, how are you physically now how are you uh how how i am now yeah. these days well uh, still I, i'm 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 okay I, i'm in good shape i'll say uh not comparing to where i was uh before the injury but, uh, you know, I, I'm training a lot and I'm getting stronger and, and more, more and more fit all the time. 
so the, the, the things that uh, I'm slacking a little bit is uh, reaction and, uh, you know, uh, the, the motoric skills and, the, the, of course, uh, being away from the ring for soon five years, I'm, I'm rusty as hell, you know, I, I, I can feel in the training sessions that I haven't uh, been fighting for a long time. But uh, yeah, I think still is things is things are moving forward, and uh, I'm I'm catching up with things, uh, and I'm still getting better. I still develop a lot, and I think I, I have this dream for my whole life, and I feel that I just can't let it go yet. Uh, I'm not ready to to give up that uh, because. The doctors also, they, 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 of course, they have the final say, but they have stated that uh, there is no bigger risk for me than for anyone else. Uh, and then I think, w w why, why couldn't I do it? Uh, I, I have not tried to get a license yet or anything like that, because I have said to myself that I'm going to feel 110% even better than I was uh, before. I try to get a license. Uh, and something I've learned is not to fight two battles at the same time. So if I'm fighting the battle of my life, getting back in shape at the same time as I'm fighting uh, for a license, uh, it would be like impossible. Uh, and I would burn myself out uh, trying to get a license and I wouldn't get as fit uh, as I want to be. And of course, if I, on the other hand, got a license before I was fit as I wanted to be, uh, I would be way too tempted to, to fight before I was back in shape. And uh, that is something that I don't want to do. No, absolutely. It's a decision um, which you need to make sure that you mentioned 110%, make sure you're a thousand percent sure and, and listen to the medical advice. But in the meantime, um, you're a natural talker. Um, and you've got a great boxing brain on you. Surely, surely we're going to have the pleasure of seeing Eric Skoglund uh, passing on all that incredible information to amateur and professional boxers um, in the future generations. It would be it'd be a shame just to sort of fall off a cliff edge. It'd be great to still have you in the uh, the boxing engine. Well, I, I really appreciate, and I think I will, one way or another, always be involved in boxing. You know because boxing has been my life since I was 11 years old and uh, well as I'm still alive luckily uh, I think uh, I was I'm I'm still all alive because of boxing uh, and and boxing is still my life and I I think about it every day uh, I, I work out myself every day uh, but uh, the day when I realized that uh, I'm not going to fight uh, again, uh, then I will find something else to do, but probably uh, as well uh, with boxing. Oh, great. I've got only one more question um, left, which is um, if you could spar any past boxing legend, who would it be? Well, I'm tempted to say something else, but I know from from the bottom of my heart that I would choose Callum Smith because he's the one and only who have uh, beaten me. Uh, and uh, I would like to, <laughs> to see uh, what I can do against him. Of course, I know I'm not in the shape and not, I'm not ready for uh, sharing the ring with him because he looks great today at these days in light heavyweight, he looks brilliant, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'd still say uh, <laughs> Callum Smith because I'm too proud to realize that uh, I, I couldn't fit him today. Uh, maybe someday I can, but not today. No, I, well, Callum's a lovely guy, as uh, his whole family is, and uh, yeah, I'm sure is. that yeah, I'm sure that if you were to uh, um, even just have a chat and have a coffee, it would be an incredible moment for you guys. You know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which would be great. Well, listen, Eric, you're, you're a massive inspiration to the boxing community. Um, the way you bounce back, the person you are, the lovely gentleman, uh, which you know, beams from you, um, means that you've got to stay in boxing. Um, I prefer not to see you boxing in the ring again, but I think it would be 
a huge huge shame for you not to be involved in training and uh, you've got so much knowledge to pass on you really do so um hopefully we're going to see you if not in the uk um at some point uh in one of your teammates corner but certainly i'd like to be seeing some publicity talk seeing that um eric skogland is is uh, is now training fighters and um and passing on all that knowledge because i think you've got so much to offer thank you i appreciate it. no brilliant well listen i wish you the very best and um Hopefully we uh, we get to see you again soon um, in the UK. Yeah, I hope. I'd love to come back to UK. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, thank you.